it test it? Greetings, everybody. Welcome to our May already, shoot, Illumination Lecture. Uh, please shut off your phones, especially the Wi-Fi. We are going live on YouTube, on our YouTube channel, and our internet down here doesn't come up as strong as it does upstairs for some reason. So the less um, people that are on it, the more frequency. Brother Esteban gets to send this off to our virtual brothers watching elsewhere. Also, uh, we will have dinner afterwards, so stick around, join us in the dining room, break some bread. And if you have any further questions for our guest speaker, you could definitely do them there, but we'll have time afterwards to ask a few questions. Uh, next month, we will have Brother Gerald Smith, who's here, talking about uh, guarding the West Gate. That is Monday, June 3rd. Six, seven o'clock, open to everybody. So if you want to partake, please swing by, seven o'clock, as always. Uh, and also, MasonicCon, you see the flyer right here. It's coming back, finally, after three years, right? Three, four, three years. Uh, your secretaries should have gotten some correspondence to read at your stated meeting this week. So if he doesn't, ask him what happened to the correspondence on group rates to make MasonicCon. That group rate's only going to last till June 15th, and then we're going to cancel it. Our website and ticket sales open on May 15th, so pretty shortly. And the event is July 22nd through the 24th, all weekend, starting off with our Pop Culture Festive Board into uh, the speakers that we have coming from all over the country to speak, do panels. Uh, lunch and dinner will be included in the ticket along with that Festive Board. We'll have vendors, so it'll be a fun weekend like it was in 2019. Uh, so yeah, that's all I have. I'd like to thank the committee for putting the event together. They work hard throughout the year. Who's here today? Brother Jerio, raise your hand. He's right over there. Brother Marco Garcia over there. Brother Gino Nadaroff over there. And Brother Esteban Lopez over here. Thank you very much for <laughs> pushing Masonic education. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker, which I had the pleasure of meeting God, maybe like six years ago, seven? November 2015. Wow, yeah, you remember it. <laughs> well, it was a year before my mass, was, my year in the East. We, he was a vendor at Grand Lodge Annual Communication, and we were both there during the low yeah. period. The World Conference. The World Conference, that's, that's right. right. It was a World Conference, and there was nobody coming to our booths because everybody was partaking inside, so we just struck up a conversation and realized he was from my neck of the woods in Orange County, where I was born and raised, and was highly impressed by his enthusiasm and love for the craft. And I knew he was gonna go somewhere, and now he's a past master, now he helps teach at the senior warden retreats, and uh, part of um, your inspector, yes. uh, uh, Grand Lodge committees, like, come a long way. So his formal introduction, uh, Brother Carlos Diaz is a master mason raised to the sublime degree in 2011 at Solomon Staircase Lodge number 357 and is still a member there. Brother Carlos is a past master and has served his lodge at various capacities. He is a member of the Grand Master Circle Do Circles, the Grand Master's Circle Donor, Public Education Advisories Council, Leadership Committee, uh, which develop the, develops the Grand Lodge retreats, 
and helps facilitate, facilitate them. He's a former Grand Lodge officer with past Grand Master Bruce Galloway and is inspector of the 905th Masonic District. Brother Carlos speaks at various lodges throughout California on multiple sub subjects and is joining us tonight to speak about Kabbalah and Freemasonry. So please give him a warm welcome. Brother Carlos, cool. it's all yours. Thank you very much. And thanks everybody for being here. Um, I don't know how much you guys know about uh, Kabbalah or um, I guess it's pronounced a couple of different ways and obviously spelled in a number of different ways. Um, I kind of got into it just out of interest. My, um, you know, me personally, I'm more just of a spiritual person. And the more I got into it, the more it just really just resonated with me, um, just like anything has resonated with you, whether it be in the church, whether it be, uh, you know, in the lodge. But uh, one of the things that it just hit me was I've always been one of those people who, you know, was raised Catholic and, you know, uh, went through the catechism, communion, all that stuff. And it seemed to give me more questions and answers. And that always, even as a kid, just kind of always kind of stuck with me. And as I got older, I started kind of searching more and more as to, uh, I guess you could say the, the, the seed that was planted was what's the meaning of life type of thing. But to me, it always developed as to why do certain things happen, right? And the more I got into Kabbalah and the more I studied it uh, through di different teachers, you find how it's explained to you in a way where it just kind of clicks. You just get it because I had read books before and it was just way over my head, like anything else. And I started studying with B'nai Baruch, which is in Israel, and I would study at five in the morning, get with a lot of students, and that's just where it made sense to me. And as I studied more with, um, you know, in masonry, start connecting the dots a little bit, you know, we all start having our own aha moment when things just make sense and they resonate. And as I got into the Scottish, Scottish Rite, the concordant body, you know, the fourth degree, the 14th, I believe it's the 30th, starts talking about Kabbalah, and I'm sitting there like, wow, I'm studying that. And I start seeing this coincidence of like, you know, wow, they're touching on things that I have an interest in. But the more you get into this craft, the more you realize a lot of things are just overlapping with one another, things are interwoven. We realize that there's a lot of cogwheels going on, and you start realizing that you're part of that. And I'll give you a quick example, two of them actually. And by the way, uh, you know, I'm here to kind of just shed light, give some information so that you guys can kind of connect the dots on your own, find out if this kind of helps lead you down another path within the craft or within your own mental capacity to find out what else is it that kind of helps you grow as a person. So the two examples I'd like to give you is that one, as far as us all being cogwheels, no matter what you might think, is imagine we're all on a boat and somebody's sitting there drilling a hole underneath themselves and Dago might say, hey, what are you doing? And the person drilling the hole is going to say, well, what concern is it of yours? I'm drilling underneath me, not you. How are we all connected with that, right? You can simply connect those dots and realize that's the way the world is. And so that's something that I learned early on when I was studying Kabbalah. And the more I thought about it, I kind of, you know, I take the, I'm more the type of person, I'm not going to take something, regurgitate it, and just kind of put it back out. Like, I really want to deep dive on it on myself. And so I started thinking, okay, we are all connected, and I believe that, but like anyone talking to me, I would be more like, well, prove it. You know, I'm the type of person, I want to get to the why. You get the answer, but why? You get to the answer, but why? I, I keep digging. And the way I came up with it was, as far as just a spiritual connection between spiritual and the corporeal, which is what we're living in right now, is, you know, if Hollywood were to stop doing animation, films, all of that, the whole world would be affected. Entertainment, jobs, you know, just kids, grandkids, right? The whole industry would affect the world. And if we were to go up to Silicon Valley, if tech stopped, apps, AI, if all that stopped, would it not affect the world? And if we went to the New York and we just said the stock market shut down tomorrow, that's it. Everyone in here, even though we're not in New York, is affected. Your 401k, your investment, your retirement, your kids' tuition, we are all affected. And if we leave the country and we go to the Middle East and we say, well, that's happening over there. It's not happening over here. What do I care? That's not my background. I don't know anyone over there. Well, next time you go to the gas, 
to the gas station to fill up your car, tell me how it doesn't affect you. And that's how it hit me that no matter what happens, we all have a ripple effect with how we're going to affect somebody next to us or somebody on the other side of the world. That alone just started really breaking down to me. There is a lot in this corporeal world that we are taught, that we are given access to, and what are we going to do with it? One phrase that I learned in Kabbalah studying um, Dr. Rod Lightman was, with the appetite comes the meal. And I don't know why, but that just stuck with me forever. And the more I just said it over and over, it just really resonated. With the appetite comes the meal. And what that means is no matter how curious you are, and even with masonry, as it br something brought you to it, as you got more involved in it, you know, Dago and I were just talking earlier how some guys, you know, they kind of lose that fire. And my year as master was really putting up a mirror to everyone's face, like, why did you become a master mason? You know, for me, you guys are my brothers, love you, we can smoke a stogie outside, we can have a drink, call you my brother, all that. But when I knocked on that door, I was not looking for another friend. I wasn't looking for somebody to have a beer with. I was looking for something else that was just really driving me to something. And I bet you were too. What was it? It's been three years, six years, ten years. Like, what was it that brought you to that door? With the appetite comes the meal. We had a desire. And now we're just sitting there looking at the plate, not eating it. You're a mason. You know, you have a spiritual realm. Maybe it's religious, you know, but you've, you had an inquiry and a desire, a point in the heart, as they may say, and now that you have access to it, or now that you've been drawn to what it is you were looking for, what are you doing? Are you still going to take that other step and just kind of keep educating yourself, keep learning? And that's where, to me, they have that intersection of the corporeal, which is what we have control over, what we can smell, you know, we can make decisions, and then you have the spiritual. And as I got older, I started figuring out that, you know what, I have a feeling or I believe that, you know, whatever it is you believe, afterlife may be, whatever, the spiritual world, you don't need to die to experience that. I have a feeling, I don't know how, but I have a feeling you can experience the two right now. And that's where you get from the corporeal to the spiritual. And as they would say, there's um, a root. There's a root meaning behind everything, even just from a blade of grass to whatever might happen in the world. And that root meaning is whatever is, uh, whatever makes it happen or whatever comes from the spiritual world, we're experiencing here in the corporeal. Now, one way to kind of experience the two is you might have a, um, an experience in your life, as I call it, a self-realized truth. And to me, self-realized truths are things that are just absolutely true to you, no matter what it is. It could be an almost, you know, a car accident where it just really just shook you, and that feeling, you can't ever explain that to anyone else. But you know that that is just absolute truth. What you just felt, what you experienced, you can't explain it to someone else. And no matter what level that self-realized truth is experienced for you, you can't convince others of that. And that's why masonry has no one secret or that one aha moment. Because whatever has resonated with me to kind of get me to that next level of, wow, that's deep, I find that to mean X, Y, Z to me. I can explain it to you, but if it doesn't mean that to you, it's not going to be the same. And so I take it with a grain of salt when I speak to people just to kind of help educate them help push them, let them think, let them ask more questions because I'm not going to convince you of everything. I just want to enlighten you and just kind of let you know, here's my perspective. Let you connect the dots from what your Masonic education and background might be, what books you've read, uh, speakers you've heard, so that as you connect all these things you hear and read and see, you start creating your own path of what is a self-realized truth to you. And like always, I like to give examples just to really just not say it's my opinion, but I'll give you an opinion. Self-realized truth. I don't expect to change your mind or convince you of anything because your own blood could not convince you, meaning your parents. Don't go out. Don't do this. Don't stay up late. Don't whatever. Did you listen? No, you didn't. I didn't listen. You didn't listen, right? Our friends didn't listen. No one listened to their parents until something happens and you're like, you were right. That's when you listen to your parents. If you want to listen to them, I don't expect you to listen to me. So I'm not here to convince you of something. I'm just here to give you examples, explain certain things of how I've interpreted them 
and how I find them to be true to me. And it's not until you have that experience that you believe your, my parents were right. I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have gone out. I shouldn't have stayed up two days in a row and then drive to Vegas, right, with my friends. Like, just whatever it might be. You just, you have to experience that self-realized truth before you can hold something as true to yourself. That's what happens in masonry. That's what happens in Kabbalah. That's what happens in religion, whatever it might be. So I... Going back to my cogwheels, I don't ever judge anyone whatsoever because it's like, I don't know what aha moment they've had that I haven't experienced yet. So whatever they find something to be true, I accept that as that's what it is to them. And so what I share with you is a couple of things. We know that masonry is not uh, religious. You know, it's really, if anything, it's supplemental to your, to your religion, meaning it doesn't replace it, it adds to it. And to me, Kabbalah is the same thing. It really just adds to whatever insight you have. And um, uh, however you decide to interpret it, you know, some interpretations I've heard is to reveal. That's what Kabbalah means, is to reveal. What is it revealing, though? It's revealing the hidden. Same with masonry. It reveals the hidden. What is it revealing? Now, you could say that masonry is occult, meaning the Latin word O-C-C-U-L-T, which means to reveal the hidden. It does not mean that it is never, ever, ever going to be found. It means it's hidden in plain sight. But until you reveal it, that's when you have that revelation. And the word revelation gets thrown around. I think that's one example where it just really hits. That's revelation. So is a self-realized truth. That's revelation. You find it within. Can't find it on that laptop can't find it in a book, can't find it online. It's something that's inside of you. And so as you tap into that for masonry, as you tap into that for your own self-realized truth, as you tap into that for another conversation I have called the master within, and as you tap into that for masonry, that is all within you. Would you like another example? When you were in school and the teacher talked about math, Right? You could connect the dots and say, yeah, yeah, I know that, you know, one plus three, or however the formula is, math explains that you're always going to come to a solution. You know that much. As I'm in fifth grade, sixth grade, eighth college, I know I'm going to figure out more math, long division, all that stuff, right? And so you assume, like, yes, I'll learn all the realms of mathematics so I can just learn what it is. But then one day the teacher starts talking about five, four, three, two, one, zero. And you're like, I know that. But then they keep going. Negative one, negative two, negative three. And you're thinking, what is this new set of numbers? Is that a secret? Was it hidden? Was it top secret that you should never find out? Or was it always there, but you didn't know about it until you were ready to learn it? That's a very simple example. That's how life acts too. Everything is hidden in plain sight. Everything is there. You just don't know it yet, or you haven't been taught it, or you haven't learned it until you are ready, whether it be someone taking you by the hand and teaching you something, or a self-realized truth that just triggered within, and you taught yourself. But it was always there. That's the hidden that is going to be revealed. And in life, to me, there is so much that is hidden that can be revealed. The same way masonry is going to maybe point you in the right direction, and get you to think and find certain things that you're in search of is the same way for me, Kabbalah has done that. Give you another example. <laughs> no matter what age you are right now, you were born with absolutely everything you have to this day. You didn't need to upgrade anything. You need to go online and buy something, put another arm. You didn't have to, everything you have right now, you were born with. And guess what? Everything you have right now, you're going to die with. And it is everything that you will ever need from birth to death. Clothes optional, cars, house, whatever. That's just inclemencies to protect us from the weather. But you have absolutely everything. And what have we done with that? Going back to school, when you were taught one plus one equals two, did anyone open your head and put that thought into you and then make you say it? It was in you. You learned it. Learn how to write your name. All that is inside of you. Nothing corporeal, nothing physical. 
Everything you've learned in college, everything you learned in the military, everything you learned to drive a car, to raise your family, has always been inside of you. Nothing physical has been given to you since birth to make you lace up your shoes, to drive a car, to eat. You just learned it. You knew it. It was inside you. It was already inside you. You just learned it. Masonry does the same thing. Kabbalah does the same thing. For some of you, religion does the same thing. So when someone says, I am God, or I want to be like God, and then in some Eastern philosophies, that's very common. Where in Western, it's kind of like blasphemy. How could you say you're God, right? You could say, you know, I have everything within me to be like him. And if you read in scripture, it does say to be like him. Not to replace him, not to be an idol worshiper, but to be like him. And that's something we strive for. We have so much within us, we have the ability to learn and to be like him. Real quick, a lot of people have asked sometimes, you know, him. Why is it him? How do you know it's a him? Not that I know exactly why, but here's the references to why it is him. And here's some references as to male, female. When you talk about Kabbalah, it's really a matter of levels that you're going through. And the reason why you say him and her is because you cannot be the outlet and the plug at the same time. You either bestow or you receive. And so like a metaphor, there's a lot of references that are esoteric to give you that idea of ebb and flow, balance, him and her. You go through plateaus, and as you learn, you know, you do plateau at some point, you might even dip because there's something greater that's coming. And you have to learn in order to realize to have that compare and contrast. If you don't have compare and contrast, you can't tell the difference between, between things. And so it's that scale that kind of gets you to realize I'm at a point of bestowing or I'm at a point of receiving. Like a parent to a child. I can give so much love to my 16-year-old son I can teach him about marketing, I can teach him about architecture, which is in my early in my career. But if he's not ready, it's not gonna make an ounce of sense. I could drill it into him, talk about you know, world-renowned architecture or ar architects, and it's not gonna make an ounce of difference. He has to be ready, and so I'm bestowing. But then he gives me love. I have more money than him, better credit score, but he gives me things I can't get. And you can make that reference with your friends, with your parents. Now look at it from a grander scale. What about the creator to us? Are we not his children? Is not that, isn't that the reference that we tell each other, that we read? And so what is it we can give the creator that the creator does not already have? Absolutely nothing. Creator has absolutely everything. It's a force that bestows. The only thing we can give it is love and that's by the interaction between one another. That's why it's him. It's never receiving other than love, but that's not like a receiving like you and I do. As we grow spiritually, as we grow religiously, as we grow within the craft. And so that's the reference, and that's where that reference comes from. I hope that, you know, this simple explanation kind of helps you start delving into it as to why some of you, or at least why I was able to kind of like help connect the dots and go from a spiritual to a corporeal and try to be able to tap into one or the other. A few ways you could tap into that is kind of like when you're half asleep. You know, you're, you're, you're not really in the sleep state of alpha, beta, or delta, but you're awake. And that's that contrast where you can kind of ebb and flow right between the two of corporeal and spiritual. People like Dalai Lama, people like, you know, uh, Balha Sulam or, you know, rabbis where they've those are people, whether you believe it or not, but those are people that have kind of tapped into that. They've been to the, to the maxom, as called the barrier. They've been there, and they've come back. Whether you believe it or not, that's fine, you know, but that's what a Dalai Lama is, that's what a rabbi is, that's what people like that who have that mental, spiritual insight a lot higher than you and I. Now, one thing that kind of made me really tap into Kabbalah of all things is because, like, as, I, as I said earlier, you know, as, as a kid or as a teen, religion tend to give me more questions than answers. 
One thing that attracted me with Kabbalah and with rabbis and you know, uh, those who call themselves Rav, which is R-A-V for great, is people who have been there done that. But what they do is they say, but here's what religion does, by the way. Religion says, you know, to some degree, and, and again, my son goes to a, a private prep all boys school um, in Anaheim. He went to private school, his old elementary and all that. There's value that you get from that. So I'm not trying to discredit religion whatsoever. You could read the Holy Scripture, you know, the Holy Writings at face value. You're going to get something good out of it. So it's not like you're not getting anything good out of it. But religion will say, you know, here's what's true, believe me. You know, it was written, therefore it's true. Well, who wrote it? I don't know who wrote it. Nobody alive knows who wrote it. But it's kind of like it is true, and it's like, okay, well, when am I going to find out? Well, when you die. Well, that's not much of an investment for me. It's like, what if I'm wrong? So that's just kind of like, a, in a nutshell, what it is, right? And a lot of people can dissect that in different ways, and I still don't discredit it. But me personally, I'm like, I kind of want proof. So with Kabbalah, what they'll say is, this is what I learned to reach the maksom, the barrier, and I've come back to explain it. But do not believe a word I say. It's like a scientist. Here's my formula, boom. The, the vessel broke and exploded. Now you do it. Here's a formula. Do it, da da da, you added this, it's a, and if it breaks, then great. Now you can believe it. It worked. And that's one thing that kind of brought me in, like, you know what, there you go. Yeah, give me some proof. Let me test it. Let me see if I believe you, and then I'll say, yeah, okay, I see where you're coming from. And that's what kind of started getting me going down that road. And the more I got into it, the more I kind of believed myself into what it is I was studying. Now, there's always a first step you need to make, maybe just like masonry as well. You take a half step, and then the creator will take another half step towards you. You get enough evidence where you're like, wow, I believe, self-realized truth. Me, maybe not you, that's okay, but me, I got something out of that. I'm going to take another step. And the creator takes another step to kind of give you whatever it is you need or you were seeking. And you keep taking those steps and you keep walking towards that light. Or as they call it, the reforming light, the light that reforms. And that's what kind of kept me kind of going and going and going. Now, I'll break it down a little bit more as to the spiritual side It's very interesting to try to describe um, because in spirituality, there's a lot of things, you know, you and I could stub our toe versus a big car wreck, and we're going to say stubbing our toe was bad, but getting in a car wreck was really bad. In spirituality, bad is bad. It doesn't matter. There's no levels of bad. It's just, it's either bad or it's good. It's a force. It's going in one direction or the other. But it's the same. And that's something we can't decipher in the corporeal. Hot and cold is the exact same thing. It's on the same polarity, but at one point, is it so cold that it's hot, or there's lack of heat that it's cold, or there's a lack of cold that it's hot? It's on the same thing. It's just a matter of where on that polarity it is. Same with vibration, same with cause and effect, same with love and hate, same with light and dark. Same polarity. It's just a matter of how dark is it that I can't see the light, or how bright is it that there's no more darkness in here. And we tend, to, we tend to categorize and put these things in silos as they're their own things, when in all reality, a lot of these things are all just the same, but they're just on different levels, different vibrations, different uh, contrast, different polarity. And so in a good way to break down Kabbalah is you have the still vegetative, animate, and speaking, and then you have above that, and that's spiritual. The still would be a big mountain. It's still. Its job is to just be still. Things like that. Dirt. Right? Doesn't need sun, doesn't need water, doesn't move, doesn't sway, doesn't do absolutely nothing but what it's supposed to do. The vegetative would be like a flower. Things that require soil, sun, rain, to grow, to live. A mountain is not living. It's just, it's fixed. That is its job. Vegetative. It could be a plant, it could be a tree, it lives. Animate, it could be an animal. It's got a little bit of those two qualities and values, but it has more things to do. It's more family-oriented. It's gonna raise, it's gonna, you know, pack of wolves, they're gonna have cubs. 
They're, gonna, they're territorial. And then you have speaking, which is the beast level, man. And we got a little bit of all of that. We can rest at night and be still. We need nourishment. We need light. We need good health. We're like the animate. But besides just creating families and besides being territorial, we also plan for our retirement. We do all these other things. And then you have the spiritual level, which is above that. Now, the difference between, if you take those five things and you look at it from a corporeal and a spiritual, in the spiritual you have natural law. It's just, it is what it is. The difference between the two, between corporeal and spiritual, is corporeal, we can negotiate our way out of anything. Any law, man-made law, ooh, man-made it, must be real. Natural law, it is fixed. Gravity is gravity. You can't, no, you can't negotiate with gravity. How are you going to tell gravity to be less strong one day than the other? It does what it's supposed to do, that's it. You get near a cliff, whether you're the prime minister of a country or you're a 15-year-old kid, you're going down. It doesn't matter. It doesn't care what your status is. It can't be negotiated. It's only job in natural law is to pull. That's it. All natural law, which is nature, all natural law does what it's supposed to do, and that's it. Man-made law, well, it can be whatever you want it to be, right? Thou shalt not kill, and we all know that, of course, duh. Unless someone breaks in your house, there's exceptions, right? The court will see it a certain way. Other than that, man shall not kill. Unless you're in uniform of your country and you go to fight a war, there's exceptions. Otherwise, man shall not kill, because that's what we all believe, unless someone breaks into your home and it's self-defense. You see where I'm going with this? And it depends on your money, and what side of the bed the judge woke up on that day, and who's in the jury box, and everything. You could have one law with two different results. How much sense does that make? Compare that to natural law. It is what it is. That's it. If I'm wearing a blue suit, the suit is blue. It's not red. It's fixed. And when you look at the spiritual versus the corporeal, the corporeal, there's just so much ebbs and flows. You know? And when you start aligning yourself a little bit more with natural law, which means you're starting to be like him, you're starting to see life through a different lens. And you could say the same thing about religion. You could say the same thing about being at a rotary club. You could say the same thing about being at lodge. Whatever is starting to align you more from that egoistic, corporeal side of life and aligning you more with natural law, you will see life through a different lens. And that's where the two start to connect a little bit more. Now, I would not say at all that, you know, I've experienced spirituality at a level that is just kind of like mind-blowing and I'm convinced. Because it is said that, you know, for you to experience spirituality, or at least at a high level, it's like a blind person has surgery and now they can see. It's not like, I wonder if the surgery worked or not. Like, no, you know. There is no maybe. <laughs> it's like being kind of pregnant. You're never going to be kind of pregnant. You're going to be pregnant <laughs> or you're not. That's it. It's one or the other. And the same thing happens with spirituality. It's not like, oh, I dipped my toe in the pool and I got a little bit sense of it. Now, that being said, I will still say that there are things in life to me where I am experiencing or I could say, to me, I would put that under the category of spirituality. I'm going in that direction. I'm experiencing things. And it could be, I think of something and it happens. It could be me wanting to have something, I don't know, manifest, I guess you could say. And it happens. I put that energy out there. Um, it could be one time I took the day off for my birthday. And I dropped off my son at school. I go to the diner. And I get my number, get my coffee, sit down. And I'm waiting for my breakfast. And I look at it, and it says 74. And I start smiling, because that's the year I was born, and I said, thank you, God, for saying happy birthday to me. Now, you could say, well, that's just coincidence, Carlos. And yes, maybe it is. But here's my argument, is that when enough of these coincidences and enough of these chances happen day after day after day, or they're predictable, or you spot something that just really makes more sense to you, and you start aligning numbers, and more coincidences happen, seven times a week, eight times a week, nine times a week, you're kind of like, wow, this is a lot of coincidences. At some point, you're like, this isn't a coincidence anymore. And you kind of see that you are 
moving yourself, you're shifting yourself, your mind, I guess you could say, into a certain direction of trying to tap into some of that energy. And that's what it is, energy. And so with masonry, I can say that, you know, what I've learned from it, how I've dissected the first degree, the second degree, and the third degree, there's a lot of spirituality peppered throughout the degrees, throughout the obligation, throughout the lecture, first and second section. There's just so much spirituality here and there. But there's also a lot of philosophy. There's also a lot of reason. You know, there's touches of Judaism as well. There's touches of Catholicism. There's, you know, there's a lot of stuff. Masonry is where a lot of that just blends together, where it, it gives you the idea, the, the opportunity, I should say, to be able to get something that you recognize and be like, okay, I get that. I've heard it before. I've been brought up on that or something. And at the same time, it challenges you. Yeah, but is that the only religion you should look at? It challenges you that way. And then at the same time, it presents other opportunities. It does a little bit of all three. And to me, that's what kind of strengthened my studies and to keep tapping into whatever it is I was learning and what I thought to be true. Of course, like anything else, I to myself have to prove it to be true and I don't take my aha moment and try to push it on others because that's just my nature. I don't feel I should do that. And at the same time, I wouldn't want someone to do it to me. So what I'd like to do is just try to present it, and this is one of many talks that I've had where it just kind of pulls back the curtain a little bit and lets you see like what's happening, at least from that level. And, and of course, there's, there's students of Kabbalah who I've met where it's just kind of like, I'm just mind blown. The same way you might meet uh, you know, a, a, a lecturer, a keynote speaker in masonry that just kind of blows you away. And then there's times, too, where I'll meet um, you know, people who've been studying it for a while or Orthodox Jews or whatever, where I'll say something, and they're kind of like, well, what does that mean? I'm like, well, you should know what our root is, right? Kind of like, you know, I'll do for you as you do for me type of thing. And it's just kind of like, so you, you, you find yourself at different levels, and I think the same could be said for this. One, one thing that I was writing out the other day, and I don't know why, wasn't for a lecture, maybe it will be, is spirituality, you, you're never going to have to wake up and be like, I hope I'm going to get hungry today. You don't fall asleep like, I hope I wake up tomorrow. You're going to wake up. You're going to get hungry. You don't have to remind yourself to breathe. There's so much in the works right now that you don't even give a second thought to. You know, you're, you're breathing since you entered this room. Have you even paid attention to it? Not once. And guess what? Every breath has been different from the one prior. No two breaths have been the same. And that's why when I come into this room and I have a degree, and I think this is where me and Dago just share that passion for masonry, is that degree will never, ever, ever be the same ever again. I don't ever think he's not going to know the words. Well, I'll wing it. I'll try to prep on it as much as I can when I get in the parking lot. And then when I go in there, I'll just do the best I can. It's life-changing. Every degree is life-changing. And you're never going to perform that same degree ever, ever again. Because you're going to miss a different word next time. Or you're going to perfect it this time, but you ain't going to do it next time. And I doubt you'll ever do it the same, because what about the stewards? What if they do something different? What if that deacon isn't there the next time? So many other things, that degree will never, ever be put on ever again the same way. Which is why when you do it, you should have absolute, you know, you should be invested in it. You should confer something that's going to be transformational to that guy. And that's where you start kind of tapping into a little bit of that spirituality, what happens in this room. And I think the way the officers at my lodge delivered the staircase lecture or gave me the obligation or gave me the charge was just kind of like, wow. I knew that when I'm going to be an officer, I'm going to have to do it that good. I can't half step. And so my year in the East, again, holding up that mirror to all them, to, to the Masons, why did you become a Mason? To having a talk like this, to having a degree or sitting in a chair, there's something transformational about that. And I think we all have the ability at every point to do something that is absolutely transformational, if not for ourselves, for other guys in the lodge, and obviously for the candidate. 
And again, what are we tapping into? Other than jewels and collars and rods, I mean, what are, what are, what are we tapping into ourselves? And we're sharing that with someone else. To me, that falls onto the side of spirituality. And that's something that you're going to share with a brother. That's something you're going to share with the other brethren. That's something you're going to share with the fellowship. Um, you know, we talk about this at the retreats, that the degree and the experience of that degree is not just when the doors close. It's prior to that. The conversations, the fellowship. And then it's the degree, and then afterwards, the mementos, going to dinner, whatever it is. That whole night is an experience. And that's what the candidate experiences. But you guys are all a part of that. And you guys are all providing some type of spirituality for that one guy. Um, you know, I can't get deep into it right now, but, you know, Dog and I were, Dago and I were talking earlier about, you know, just a second degree. To me, that, the first is, you know, it is what it is. The second, to me, though, that's where I think a lot of that, at least for me, because we can all interpret it differently, but I think that's, to me, is where a lot of spirituality just starts getting presented to you. And if you don't catch it, then it's okay, but I hope at some point you do, whether you reread it or you're sitting on the sideline and you watch the degree and something jumps out at you like, oh, wow, I never caught that before. There's so many messages and lessons that can be given. Um, I'd like to stop and just kind of find out if there are any questions with anything I've asked or if there's an idea or something that's popped into your head that you never gave thought to that you'd want to ask right now. Because I know it's a lot. And it doesn't have to be like a lot like you believe it, but it, it's, it's a lot as far as I never looked at it that way or I never heard of it or I've never, you know, I never knew a friend that studied it. Is there anything that sticks out to any of you guys? Yeah, brother. Um, the question is, when did I first get into Kabbalah? How did I hear about it? What did I think about it? And I had heard of it before, but I thought it was something that was tied strictly to a region or a religion or a sect. And the more I got into it, it is not. It's actually global and universal. And the more I got into that, I realized that it's ubiquitous, which means it's everywhere at the same time. There's no start point, no stop point no above, no below, and to me, that just kind of piqued my interest even more. And as I found out that it's not a religion, and as I found out more on the spiritual side, which again, to me, that's just where I'm drawn, it started to quench that, that thirst, that, uh, you know, that hunger for, for knowledge. And I guess my knowledge, you know, we could look at philosophy or something like that, but to me, my knowledge was more on that realm. And the more I got into it, the more it started opening doors within and the more other things made sense to me. But at first, I thought it was religious. I thought it was tied to something with religion, but it's not. Any other questions? There's something to ponder? <laughs> so wh one last thing I I'll say is, um, um, you know, to me, I'll, I'll, I'll wake up early every day, I'll, I'll meditate. To me, that's just a way of a habit, practice, to try to tap in two things, is try to tap into myself and try to tap into a wavelength to speak with the Creator, to try to make sense of it, right? Even if you have a strong religious background, I think you're, you're trying to make sense of something, you know, religion itself. And I think that's something you're always gonna try to learn, but who's gonna give you that answer? And same with me. I don't know who's going to give me that answer. The, the best you can do is try to tap into it and try to find out what does it all mean. So if I have a good day, I try to find out why did I have a good day? What is the root meaning? Again, there's something below it. I don't know what it is. I want to find out what is the root meaning below that. Why did I have a good day? If I have a bad day, I want to find out why did I have a bad day? Because I know there's a message somewhere there. I just don't know it because I'm too much into the corporeal, and I want to try to find out what, what's the message there, what's the example, what is something I should learn. And so, in my opinion, and, I, and as you can tell, hopefully by now, I, I'm not very religious. To me, it's just creator-creature. To me, I look at it that way. 
Everything in between, I, I just, I block it out. It's, you have a direct connection to the Creator, and that's what Kabbalah has kind of given me, is that direct connection. No filtration, no confusion, just me and the Creator. And whatever I think of it, that's that connection that makes sense to me. Because when you do remove history and religion and images and bearded men, you start, for me, it started simplifying a whole lot more. It's just a force. There's no picture to the, to the creator, whatever you might call it. It's a force. It's not a human being. It's a force. It's bestowing something. So there is no image. That helps because then it less, you know, it's less confusion. And what really helps tie me into that, this is a question I asked, I believe, in Anaheim or Bellflower, but what helps tie me into that is I had asked the guys, one guy, I think he questioned me, and he was saying, yeah, what about this? Yeah, what about this? I said, okay, do me a favor, and you guys can do the same thing, is think of the year you were born. Think of that year. And then tell me why you chose that year. I'll wait. And if you happen to answer that question at some point in your life, tell me why you chose that region or that city to be born in. And if you can answer that question, ask yourself, why did you choose those parents? Of all the people in the world, why did you choose those two? And it just leveled me. Leveled me. You don't have to be religious to be thinking there is a creator, there's a force, there's something that was in the works for you a long time ago. I'm not saying you have absolutely no control of your life. I'm not saying that whatsoever, or that it's blind faith, or just go do whatever because it's going to work out. I'm not saying that. You do have control. But my point is, the year you were born, and the kids, you know, the friends you had as a kid, the parents you had, the religion, the military background, your academia, your neighbors, everything, everything, everything in your life has been put in front of you for a reason to make you who you are right now and to hopefully give you a little bit of a thirst to keep figuring out, you know, why. I guess that's the best question to, to, to put it in that perspective, why. I do believe you have control over what it is you're going to make of yourself, what you're going to do, what you're going to, you know, uh, collaborate with how you're going to influence others. I totally believe in that. I guess the best way to kind of answer that is, is that there's a door and you walk by it and you don't notice it. And that door gets moved up again and you walk by it and you don't notice it. And it gets moved up again and at some point you're going to notice and be like, oh, let me walk through this door. That to me is kind of like what answers or what hopefully doesn't make you think like, yeah, you're right, the creator put a lot of things in play. I had no power and no decision making in that. But hopefully it makes you think that, okay, so it's not blind faith. At the same time, I do have power, but I just need to stop and recognize things around me. And that's probably the best way I could have explained it earlier. To me, I'm trying to recognize everything around me because I see it through a different lens. I see life through a different lens because of Kabbalah. So not that I'm questioning everything just to be, you know, curious, but when things happen, when I take note of things around me more than I used to, when I notice coincidences, I try to connect the dots. And to me, that's how I can implement it every day as much as I can. Obviously, we all get busy with corporeal things and things happen and we don't spend time for ourselves. But the more I can try to combine those two and when I come into this lodge and try to slow down the vibrations and try to pick up on things that I haven't noticed before, then the more I get out of masonry, the more I connect with other people. So hopefully that's another layer that hopefully doesn't confuse you, but kind of helps explain me and helps you guys, you know, try to answer your own questions, I guess is the best way to say it. Because that self-realized truth, I think you are all going to eventually find it with yourself. It's not going to be a book or your best friend. I think it's going to, and by the way, I think when we get challenged or when things happen in life, I think that's when we all kind of dig deep. And I think that's when we find answers to certain things we're looking for, but... Any other questions you guys have? Thoughts, ideas, disagreements? Yes. I love that you said that there are different disciplines in Kabbalah that are very confusing. I don't think I've ever run into that particular one. I, I just think that's the life that I've kind of seen in the past when I taught Kabbalah. No. And in all of my work there, it's like there's an emphasis for everything, there's an energy for everything.
Yeah. 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 And so, you know, for her, Kabbalah has been a little bit different. It's obviously been, a, you know, you've tied it to a life experience. Um, and, and you're right. It just, it, there's a lot of different ways to explain it. And that's why it's kind of it's like when, you know, you're riding in a cab and some guy's like, hey, oh, you're a Mason? What, what is it? And you've got five minutes to say it. You know, an ele elevator speech of explaining what Masonry is. The same is equal with trying to explain um, uh, Kabbalah. And you're right, it is whatever that you will take from it. Um, there's certain lessons, obviously, there's certain uh, phases, um, there's certain examples that you can get from a, you know, from a fu fundamental standpoint, from an educational standpoint, but it's really you connecting the dots at some point, um, you know, and, and you get to a point, kind of like masonry, and I, I say masonry because I think you guys can really relate with that, where you're so gung-ho about it, whether it was your first degree or you're just kind of getting more into it, you became an officer and you're learning more and you feel that pride of teaching the young mason that comes in, but you get to a point where you almost want to cheerlead it. Like, you guys just don't get it. Like, oh my God, like, you, you don't get it. Like, this is what happened or this is the way I see things. And, and you can't really push that on other people. And I, and I learned that early on, like, because then I'm the crazy guy at that. You know, it's like, <laughs> oh, there's that crazy guy, right? And it's like, oh man, I'm the crazy guy now. <laughs> like, I can't seem and sound like the crazy guy. So it's kind of like, I, I just got to keep it to myself. You know, you, you know, how, how do you get so amped up about masonry? You're telling friends and they're kind of like, okay, hey, relax, okay? Like, <laughs> I'll get into it when I want to get into it. Uh, just like anyone standing on the street corner with a sign saying Jesus is coming, right? You know, is that the crazy guy or does that guy have revelation that you and I have not experienced? You don't know. And so <laughs> when I talk about this or anything else, it's just kind of like, look, let me just put the cards on the table and try to explain as much as I can. And hopefully the metaphors, the examples start making sense where you're like, yeah, you know what? I can, I can see, you know, I may not agree, but I can see where he's coming from. I get it. I get it. It makes sense to me now. And, uh, you know, you apply it to your own life and just see how it goes from there. Any other questions? Yes. So the question is with regards to uh, the example I said earlier about corporeal uh, life and natural law or spirituality, I guess you could say, what actions do I do to try to align myself more with that? Um, let me give you an example. Think of a forest as natural, right? It's been around for decades, hundreds of years, hundreds of years. It's survived, right? Storms, hurricanes, water, dry, dry summers. It's still there, right? All the trees are still there. They're all flourishing. There's animals, there's little ticks, there's everything. It still lives, right? That is all 100% natural. You and I can create a garden, nicely manicured, and the grass is trimmed, and rich soil, daisies. But if you and I stop taking care of that, what happens? It just turns into whatever it's supposed to be. It's going to be natural. And the more we try to control something, you know, we want it to look nice, so we're just going to keep, you know, every day we're going to have to tend to it, put water and rich soil and all that. We're making it become what we want it to become. Not that it's, not that it's becoming something it shouldn't, but you and I are trying to create something just for the satisfaction of our ego. And ego is one thing that really keeps you in the corporeal. Everything you do is ego. I've, I've, I think that's the one turning point that I will say that really drew me into Kabbalah is dropping a lot of my egoism. I mean a lot. We are all egoistic, all of us. And that's one thing that slapped me in the face because I didn't realize how egoistic, not that I was bad or anything, but naturally, right? Mother Teresa was egoistic. 
She had to build those orphanages because it hurt her to see kids suffering. Like, that's egoism. She was egoistic. Our ego of wanting to do something because of what we're going to get in return. Otherwise, we're not going to do it. If couples got pregnant, went through the whole pregnancy, and it was like absolutely nothing happened but pain, nobody would do it. But we judge what we're going to get in return versus that pain, obviously the women more than the men, (laughs) but because that is a greater value than what we have to go through. What we get in return is the greater value, and we are willing to go through that egoism for that. If I said there was a quarter outside, how many of you would run up and go grab it right now? And if it was pouring rain, I said, hey, I walked in, I saw a duffel bag, bundles, just bricks, $100 bills out there. I don't know whose it is. Who would get up and run out there, torrential drain uh, of rain coming down? And there's so many examples, but you just kind of start really digging deep to the root of, yes, we are all egoistic, and that's what keeps us in the corporeal without exploring or trying to think of what more is there. In that nicely manicured garden, if we don't tend to it and tend to it and tend to it, at some point it's just gonna, it's gonna become what it is. And that's gonna be okay because that's what it's supposed to be, natural. And the more you start aligning yourself in life with natural law and things that are just more, because natural law is the creator. Like that, that, that's everything he is. He created that. That's what is right, I guess you could say. Not that we're wrong, but the more you start aligning yourself up with that, the more things just make sense. The more you, for me at least, let me just say that. The more things made sense, the more I had answers to questions I had, the more I saw life through a different lens. All of those things just started lining up. And when that happens, just like anything else in life, hey, this is working good, I like it, it feels good, whatever it might be, I'm gonna do more of it. And so it was just maybe that taste of it that made me feel like this aligns with my life or this answers my question. So I'm going to do more of it. And I would think that it's benefited me to some degree. Maybe I'm a better person, better husband, whatever it might be. But I think it would benefit me to some degree. And it's helped me bring a little bit more value into this lodge room when I am with my brothers and when we have an OSI and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm uh, talking to the lodges about it. But you're going to find your own way of why you want to do that and how you're going to do it. Just like the way I did not get a definite answer by studying with B'nai Baruch, I just found answers to my questions, and that's what helped drive me a little bit more, and that's what would help drive anybody else. I hope that answered your question or gave you a little clarity. If not, then Dago, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. The food is warm.